the title of my talk is For Those Who Bore the Battle, VA Palo Alto and the Outpatient COVID Response. And so I'm actually going to begin with a story, uh, the COVID Christmas story. So it was three days before Christmas, and we were almost out of Pfizer vaccine. Demand for boosters had exploded in recent days, partly because of the coming Omicron wave, partly because I'd been giving them by bicycle. This was good news. But unless we could find more by tomorrow, we would need to turn away patients, some whom we've been urging to get vaccinated for most of the last year. I've been working on COVID nearly nonstop since March 2020. And most recently, that meant inserting myself, usually uninvited, in facility-wide vaccine operations. Our vaccination rates had stalled by late spring, notwithstanding a national mandate to place 20,000 callbacks to 12,000 unvaccinated veterans. And when two residents, residents and I analyzed the data, the reasons why the reason why was obvious. So by June, Nearly all, interest, all interested veterans who are willing and able to make pre-scheduled appointments at a clerk's call were already vaccinated. But our 12,000 remaining undecideds who came disproportionately from poorer zip codes near our Stockton, Sonora, and Modesto clinics would need something more. Over the next three months, I wrote three separate pro protocols with detailed workflows articulating a new vaccine strategy. Rather than scheduled appointments and designated vaccine clinics, a term that had already become politically loaded for some veterans, we needed daily walk-in access in locations that were both visible, the parking lot, and trusted, the primary care clinic. In addition to convenience, this approach, approach sent a message. First, our institution, which most veterans still trusted, placed a high value on getting them COVID vaccines. And second, vaccines were part of routine care, the way back to normal. The, la the last 18 months, of course, had been anything but. So our, the first proposal was called Swab Shot and Go. It moved unused Johnson & Johnson doses from employee health to our testing tent, where we would offer them to asymptomatic patients there for pre-op screening, as well as to random passersby. We printed postcards, post postcards and listed screeners to hand them out, uh, uh, to, hand them out to patients uh, entering campus, asked our transport drivers to visit us on their rounds, and by August, this walk-in clinic and its partners across the system had given some 900 first doses and bumped our rates to 68%. My next move in August was less a proposal than a guerrilla campaign. The J&J clinics were humming, but our, our mRNA appointments were still vacant. Our vaccine coordinator went on vacation just as the ACIP um, issued a new recommendation for third doses for immunocompromised veterans, or uh, immunocompromised patients, excuse me. So over the weekend, I enlisted 20 primary care providers uh, working on their time off to enter over 2,000 appointment orders uh, for our most immuno, the most immunocompromised patients in our system. Our schedulers followed the orders. These patients were eager to book. Uh, and by the next week, we were giving 96 doses per day in Palo Alto, plus dozens more in Livermore, Monterey, and San Jose. The crowded clinics drew unvaccinated bystanders, reassured by their immunocompromised co-veterans. And now we, and we began giving first doses too. This, this also gave primary care doctors a place to send their clinic patients. My third proposal came in October after ACIP recommended widespread use of boosters uh, for everyone. This time, my plan was to stock Pfizer and primary care clinics for just in time. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, I distributed the proposal through expanding circles of sympathetic colleagues, then to nurse and pharmacy partners, and finally to hospital executives, including our deputy chief of staff. I'd become aware of these folks, or rather, they'd become aware of me when I started testing my primary care patients on the, uh, on the tarmac in front of the hospital back in March of 2020. There were barriers. Uh, misplaced fears about anaphylaxis persisted. And more importantly, every wasted dose I gathered would need to be documented and reported to Washington. But in the end, I was granted two vials per day with the promise of more if we use them and a personal warning that I not let any go to waste. And thus began my twice daily vaccine by bike clinic. Each evening, in lieu of dinner with my family, I would leave clinic, grab any remaining doses, uh, and ride around campus vaccinating anyone I could before the six hour beyond use date. 
I gave vaccines in our dialysis suite, the emergency room, physical therapy, optometry. I gave them to veterans, to colleagues, to cleaning staff, to veteran spouses, even per the VA's fourth mission to civilian visitors. I developed an, an efficient pitch. I'm Matt Stevenson. I'm a primary care doctor, and I've committed that no veteran steps on campus without being offered a COVID vaccine that I could deliver before hopping back on my bike with a flourish and then riding off to the next patient. By mid-December, my bike riding was no longer needed. With Omicron bearing down, even skeptical veterans were clamoring to get boosters. Like me, they remembered the previous Christmas when our, when our hospital overflowed and cars lined up at dawn at our respiratory tent, some with hypoxemic patients needing parking lot triage. By the week before Christmas, we were easily exhausting 50 doses per day. On December 23rd, the day after that message from our pharmacy chief, we expected 40 scheduled veterans plus at least a dozen walk-ins. After receiving the message, I expanded the chat to include, hesitantly, our deputy chief of staff. We had 13 vials at our smaller Livermore campus where foot traffic was lighter and our burn rate was slower, and it was not too late to transfer these doses where they were needed. And as I saw it, to keep our promise to our patients. I strongly recommend that we transfer at least 50 doses from Livermore, I wrote to the group. Then I click send and I left early for the day, not, not knowing the outcome. I had also committed earlier that week to go skiing with my family for Christmas. It was my first break in months and unless I wanted to get stuck in a blizzard, I had to leave on time. My wife noticed that I was even more distracted than usual as we drove past Livermore in the rain. I could see the VA through the windshield, and I had visions of stopping the car, knocking down the door to pharmacy, and driving the doses back to Palo Alto myself. Only the coming storm and the inevitable consequences to my marriage compelled me to file this one in the realm of fantasy and keep driving. So uh, my name is Matt Stevenson. Uh, I work in primary care at the VA, and I'm here to make sure that uh, no one on the call leaves without being offered the new COVID booster for the uh, FLIRT3 variants. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, I am here uh, to tell the story of our medical lifetimes, or at least of mine. Uh, so the, uh, I'm sorry, I had uh, technical difficulties here, uh, right at the critical moment, of course. <laughs> There we are. Sorry about that. So, problem, man. so I'm here. So I'm here to tell the story of my medical lifetime. So the part about me is nearly over. Uh, although I do want to talk about how and why I morphed overnight uh, from a second year primary care provider to a leader or at least an influencer in the pandemic response of a 60,000 patient healthcare system. Uh, I also want to tell the story of my colleagues. Uh, doctors and nurses everywhere, VA and Stanford, who stepped up during the pandemic to serve society. Then I want to talk about my institution. Uh, I want to talk about its objectively outstanding achievements in testing, vaccination, and prescribing, and also its unique mission and its unique role in the American healthcare system. Then I'd like to de deconstruct three pandemic myths. So before I show what those are, I want to state that myths aren't lies. Myths are actually critical tools for organizing society, and they contain an element of truth, but they need to, they need to be rigor, rigorously examined and reorganized at least once a generation. So myth one is that the system is broken. Myth two is that doctors are or that doctors are not heroes. And myth number three is that no one trusts institution, institutions. Then I'd like to share three post-pandemic visions new myths around which we, which we can reorganize ourselves. The first is medicine is a public utility, something too critical to the functioning of society to depend on the heroism of individual doctors. The second is physician as what I'm calling a population risk manager. A uh, servant leader might be another word for it, uh, or if instead of individual heroes, we need working systems, then physicians must be the ones to build them and maintain them. And then third, I'd like to pro uh, 
propose a vision of an academic medical center as Plato's Academy. If we're going to build a better system, we need our academic medical centers to teach us how to do that. And then I'm going to conclude by asking what physicians will do during the next crisis, uh, because we know when it's coming. So part one, I'm calling the names and faces of heroes. It's a quote from a college professor of mine. Uh, they did not separate us tonight. We finished alive together whole this one more time. So in college, I was an English major. And if I was trained to do anything, it was to deconstruct, deconstruct stories and put them back together again. Uh, I came to medicine in my late 20s after briefly, briefly working in magazine journalism. And I used scare quotes, as you may have seen from that last image there, uh, because I well, it wasn't actually a journalist per se. I was an executive assistant to Condé Nast, uh, which is the publisher of serious journals like The New Yorker, but also several glossy fashion magazines. Um, if you've ever seen The Devil Wears Prada, you have a, a sense of my job, only it was less glamorous, and I didn't work for the devil. Instead, I worked for a lifelong reporter who moved to the executive suite to manage the delicate balance between business and creative interests, and often uh, to take a stand for the creatives. So I did this until the 2008 economic collapse, when the consumerism that was celebrated the by the magazines I worked for no longer just seemed frivolous, but dangerous. And I was looking for something more. And of course, there was a new political movement promising health care for the nation uh, that pointed the way. And so I went into medicine. So I kept writing during training, uh, first for my mental health, second as a sort of semi uh, scholarly alternative to research, and then third to sort of test the ideals that had brought me to medicine, uh, to see if they stayed true. Uh, in residency, I'd ima imagined writing a coming of age memoir about working uh, during a generation defining epidemic. But someone here had already done that. Uh, so with the help of an anonymous donor and a skilled co-editor, I decided I'd launch a magazine of my own. Uh, this was meant as a literary journal or a medical literary journal. But um, speaking of mythology, I used it to smuggle in a vision uh, like a Trojan horse. I used it to smuggle in a vision of medicine as a, so a social good. So. In the introduction to the magazine, I wrote, we believe American healthcare continues to need transformation. Our industry comprises 20% of an economy more unequal than any since 1928. Our patients' wealth-based mortality gap is growing, even as their life expectancy shrinks. The same deaths of despair responsible for these trends, overdose and suicide, claim unacceptable numbers of our own trainees. We believe the answers to these problems lie with literature as well as science. So... My job as a VA primary care doctor was therefore a mix of idealism, pragmatism, ideology, and destiny. So regarding destiny, I was born on November 11th. Uh, my great grandmother, as I've said at other talks, was Eleanor Roosevelt's secretary of state, or I'm sorry, uh, not secretary of state, uh, personal secretary. <laughs> that was not, uh, the, the, not quite that important. Um, as for pragmatism, uh, I sensed that uh, uh, the VA's lower pr productivity pressures uh, would give me time to listen to my patients, raise my kids, and maybe do some writing. And as for ideals, uh, during my time in a resident clinic, I came to see VA Palo Alto as the closest I could get in Silicon Valley to the nationwide social epidemics, isolation, mistrust, polarization, that I thought medicine could help address. And I saw this particularly in my pain patients. So in 2018, Veterans were dying of suicide or overdose approximately once per hour, uh, or so said the most up-to-date statistics from the CDC, which actually were dated from 2015. Uh, more on that problem later. Um, and prescription opioids, of course, had much to do with it. But as I listened to my pain patients, uh, I realized that prescriptions were only part of what was an iatrogenic problem. So to use the words that now saturate our culture, Opioid dependence in this population struck me as the ultimate socially and structurally determined disease. A young man joins the military, whether for money or idealism or the promise of lifelong health care. He, or increasingly she, gets injured during service or training. To get the soldier back to the line, he's offered opioids. Opioids biochemically induce tolerance and withdrawal, which are criteria for opioid use disorder, diagnosis, and the right context. And then the context changes. Dominant cultural narratives, CDC prescribing guidelines, opioids go from medicine to disease, and the patient goes from managing pain 
to meeting criteria for a substance use disorder. Now, a decent number, about 250 of these high-risk pain patients uh, on greater than 90 morphine equivalents per day uh, got care at VA Palo Alto. And though they were, uh, and they were overwhelmingly uh, from our rural clinics in the Central and Salinas Valleys, the same clinics I would later find where vaccination rates were lagging. They included a young Oklahoma, a, a young airman from Oklahoma with a bad shoulder, whose pharmacy runs for early Norco refills were jeopardizing our mar his marriage. Uh, an older Marine who witnessed the extermination of 95% of his platoon in Vietnam and who managed his PTSD with beer and mountain living and his back pain with oxycodone. And a for for former Army Bush pilot who lost millions in the dot-com bust uh, and whose, pr whose private pain physician es escalated his morphine equivalents greater than 200 per day before cutting him off and whom I treated by text message one Saturday as he withdrew in our defender's watch. All these patients, I feared, were not just at risk of overdose. They were at risk of losing whatever trust in medicine and society they may have still they may have still retained. But medicine had a treatment, buprenorphine, and I was de determined to learn how to use it. So I include the following primer because at least back in 2018, few doctors knew how to use buprenorphine, and this was not because the drug was complicated. So it's a long-acting, avid-binding uh, opioid which blocks and displaces other opioids. It's a partial, considered a partial agonist, which means that it causes minimal respiratory depression. Theoretically, a risk of precipitated withdrawal if taken with other opioids. And as multiple studies showed, equivalent analgesia. The, the thing that prevented other doctors from using buprenorphine uh, was a thicket of misperception and red tape. I think it's so deep that a cynical veteran might wonder if medicine didn't know what it was doing, or rather if medicine simply didn't care about their pain, their military service, or even the opioid epidemic at all. There were, of course, other forces in society ready to capitalize on that anger. But if there was any place that could solve the problem, it was the VA, specifically VA Palo Alto. So when I started residency, my program director described VA Palo Alto as sort of a jewel in the crown of the Department of Veterans Affairs. They still have the canteen and bad cell service, he said, but it's otherwise unlike any other VA you've been to. He meant this as a compliment, but true believers like me would disagree. So the VA offered wraparound social services, housing, the GI Bill, transportation benefits. Uh, it included investments in high value preventive preventive and mental health care. And I believe the VA occupied a place in its patients' lives that was unique in American medicine. So to this impressive complement of services, I plan to add a high-risk opioid deprescribing clinic for patients across the system. Opening day was going to be March 18th, 2020. So given everything I've just said, it was natural when the pandemic arrived that veterans would turn to the VA for answers just as many patients turned to their doctors. In the second week of March, I received a flood of messages from worried patients with fevers, coughs, exposures to international travelers. Test kits were scarce and guidance was changing, but each patient had a clear indication for a test, a healthcare job, a frail spouse, a shelter full of roommates clinging to sobriety. They were looking to me for a plan. With no established workflows, I began bringing them to clinic and swapping them on the patio. So when I talk about that time, I often show these images of growth curves and empty shelves, my pandemic triptych, partly as a reminder, partly as a metaphor. At the time, it felt like the wave was crashing on everything we cared about and the cupboard was bare. But at VA Palo Alto, this was not true. So weeks before, while most of the nation and I were still sleeping, my inpatient colleagues had converted our spinal cord unit to a quarantine facility and had taken in VA patient number one from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. National VA had secured uh, PPE in the all hazards emerg emergency catch, the VA's own small strategic national stockpile. Additionally, the VA's public health reference lab under Mark Holodny had developed and validated a lab developed test and with clinical lab, had secured 7,500 additional test kits uh, coming the next week. So in summary, and I didn't know it, the VA was part of an aging federal apparatus for pandemic preparedness and emergency response. 
But on March 11th, those test kits were still trickling in and the workflows were non-existent. So I turned to the other most powerful institution I know. So I'm going to turn the audio down here. But this is a text message exchange, uh, first with a couple of former resident colleagues um, asking what was happening at Stanford. And they informed me that uh, Stanford was testing up or was standing up a testing site in the parking lot of the Hoover building. And Linda Barman kindly offered to show me around. So it was the third day of what I soon learned was the third drive through testing site in the country. So Maya Artandi helped to run the clinic. Uh, she later stood up the Crown Clinic, where, which actively solicited COVID patients to come in for outpatient care um, when many facilities were avoiding them like the plague. Uh, and Lauren Edwards, an old friend from my narrative medicine days, uh, showed up to volunteer as a swabber. So I spoke with Linda uh, yesterday about what that was like. Um, and she described things that happened at lots of facilities. So the site in the parking lot moved to the garage, then to big tents on the football field. It was staffed largely by express care. Uh, to quote Linda, my team kicked ass. And it was weirdly kind of fun. So she talked about a sense of mission that was reinforced in part by expanding services to those who were unable to pay for them, and in some cases, unable to make scheduled appointments. She also talked about that being a shared mis mission with arborists, fire marshals, electricians, how many people uh, there were who needed to do their jobs. And many of those people include patients coming in terrified, needing answers. When I asked Linda if she felt like uh, we needed something more than she and her colleagues really being the last line of defense. She replied, well, she didn't see it that way. She said, if you have a highly trained, highly motivated workforce, they'll come up with solutions if you give them freedom and resources. So the sincerest form of flattery, of course, is imitation. And uh, that afternoon, equipped with workflows from Maya and Linda, I went back to the VA. Uh, I translated the workflows into um, uh, into note templates, uh, rallied support, and fairly quickly, uh, a large group of us stood up a well-running medical clinic to preserve safe in-person ca in, in -person care, spare PPE, and offload the emergency room. In Palo Alto, this came complete, complete with phlebotomy uh, and x-ray. Uh, and we launched a network of sister clinics um, at our uh, sea box across the Bay Area. Um, there were incredible contributions, just, in, just as at Stanford, from all across the system, facilities, planning, uh, IT, police. Uh, there was that same sense of esprit de corps. Uh, there uh, were leaders stepping up, facility pitching in. Uh, again, that sort of sense of building the plane as we flew it. And... In the next couple, the next days, I step back to focus on um, communication and strategy. So, in addition to uh, seeing patients and testing for diagnosis or to assist mitigation efforts by helping them quarantine or break quarantine or serving the healthcare system by doing pre op screening, we also realized that we needed a plan. So, after after a spring spent scrambling, building the plane while we flew it and then flying it blind, we wanted to know how to land it. And to do that, we needed actionable, actionable information. Where was the disease? Who was it infecting? And then you, to use our testing data to inform uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions and other operational choices. This was a little naive. Uh, so this was our small group of, um, I'd say our, um, uh, unofficial incident command. We had an actual incident command who made decisions over things like NPIs that flowed up through national VA and the county and the state. Uh, but we did have some control over operational choices, like how to staff our tents, where to allocate rapid tests, where to target vaccine outreach. And so uh, Arthi Chari, our infectious disease lead on the outpatient side, devised uh, an electronic health record strategy to tag each test with the indication for the test and a collection site. 
Now, large scale testing needs lab workers and supplies. Uh, and this relied on uh, the around the clock work of lab techs shown here who were doing testing and then manufacturing test kits when we ran out of them. Uh, so Kristen Jensen, our lab director, who's also pictured here, uh, made it all run smoothly, uh, so smoothly that in January of 22, when that Omicron wave finally arrived, uh, we were doing 5,000 tests per month with an average turnaround time of less than a day. As for our epidemiology, well, what we learned wasn't surprising. In summer of 2020, our COVID hotspots, Modesto, Stockton, perfectly overlapped with uh, the spots, the sites where we were doing the most opioid prescribing and later the least vaccinating. I'm going to talk about some other heroes. Uh, so John Chardos uh, directs primary care uh, at really all facilities across our network, apart from the flagship. Uh, and early on, he made a commitment to equitable care. That meant equitable testing, vaccinating, prescribing. Oh. Uh, a test is only as good as the education and the counseling that comes with it. And so he stood up uh, a centralized team to handle positive results notifications for four years. They're still making calls uh, to every page, everyone that, that popped up in our lab. Uh, and then in 2000 or in 2022, uh, he converted that team to the Paxlovid prescribers on duty, uh, which, as you can see here, prescri prescribed at higher rates than any VA on the West Coast. Um, I'm also going to talk about Sherry Fedak. So Sherry was a nurse practitioner from the Cleveland VA. Uh, she moved to Palo Alto in 2021. Um, and for a little while, she transferred from her old frontline work, uh, which had been doing night shifts, night shifts on the COVID ward in Cleveland, to a triage role in our transfer center. But within a week, she found herself missing my old COVID family and volunteered to work in our respiratory tent. And then when we got access to Ebusheld, uh, that's this red bar here, uh, Evusheld, for those who may have forgotten, is a bivalent long-acting monoclonal. Uh, it was authorized for pre-exposure prophylaxis in immunocompromised patients unable to mount a vaccine response. Sherry volunteered again and then single-handedly prescribed more Evusheld than all other VAs in the region combined. Uh, more heroes. Uh, so Laura Kinzel, uh, was an internist who, for the last 14 years, had been doing benefits evaluations until March 2020. Um, I interviewed Laura, uh, she said, and uh, I uh, supervised her during her first couple days in the respiratory tent. Um, so the first month was hard, said I almost felt like uh, I, was uh, I was almost 60 years old and felt like an intern, drowning in a, a sea of atrophied skills and the global soup of ignorance of this new pathogen. The, system, the, the systems of working in a pandemic were in their infancy. I had a patient who lived in a home with seven other people sleeping in the hallway. No way he could isolate. I didn't know what to do, so I took that helpless anger out on poor Matt Stevenson. After recovering, he gave me a name, Gene Lighthall. So Gene Lighthall and Nina Ramshandani uh, run VA Palo Alto's homeless outreach team. So for the last 20 years, veteran homelessness has declined dramatically, partly due to people like Gene and Nina, but also partly due to well-funded, uh, well well-designed pol policy partnerships uh, between the VA and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. You know, a theme of my talk, which I'm going to get to in a minute, is that um, to make change, heroes aren't enough. You need well-designed policies well-crafted partnerships, and then careful implementation and implementation study. But in um, wartime, in a crisis, uh, sometimes heroes are needed to, and there was no one more heroic than the homeless out outreach team. So my collaboration with them uh, really involved a two-way exchange of patients. Uh, so if a veteran sought admission to uh, a VA-affiliated shelter, we did rapid pre-admission testing in the respiratory tent. If a homeless veteran walked into the tent for a test, we'd contact Gene's team who'd find them a place to stay. But they did so much more. Uh, they ran an on-site vac uh, vaccine clinic at VA shelters and from their mobile unit. They vaccinated a veteran whose PTSD was so severe that he said he would never set foot at the VA, but still accepted a vaccine from them. Uh, 
they did weekly surveillance and outbreak testing at the VA's 12 contracted homeless shelters, uh, including veterans who were ineligible for, for VA care. Uh, Mark Holodny, the director of the VA's public health research, uh, reference lab, agreed to process the tests for non-VA patients free of charge. So that was the story about the heroes. Now I'm going to deconstruct some COVID myths. This is another uh, literary quote. So the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and to still retain the ability to function. One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. So I love Fitzgerald. I vaguely recollected this quote. I looked it up, and as a test of my ability to hold two contradictory things in my mind at the same time, the first hit wasn't the Fitzgerald quote, but when you Google the uh, ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time, what you get is a reference to the word doublethink uh, from Orwell's 1984, which refers to the ability of people under totalitarian regimes uh, to be able to think two contradictory things at once. So, I'm going to deconstruct three myths. One is, uh, and each myth has an element of truth. Um, and I think a, a useful organizing function for people in society, but they need to be scrutinized, reevaluated, and uh, I would say uh, converted into something new. So. To make sense of COVID, uh, I have spent the last year or so reading not just um, uh, not just literature, but uh, history, uh, including this recent history, Lessons from the COVID War. So it was organized by Philip Zelikow, uh, who is a fellow at the Stanford's Hoover Institute. He was also the person who organized the 9-11 Commission. Um, it includes physicians. Uh, the, the COVID crisis group includes physicians from Stanford and VA Palo Alto. And... Um, the premise of the book is that America went to war, and he refers to the COVID response as a war, with unsurpassed scientific knowledge, thousands of people and organizations who made heart-rending, life-saving efforts, and yet our institutions did not meet the moment. So Americans improvised to fight this war, doing the best they could. They had to struggle with systems that made success hard and failure easy. And, you know, I could relate to that. Uh, my experience that Christmas Eve, on the one hand, was a success story. We got those 48 doses, we got them in veterans' arms, and presumably that was 48 fewer people we saw in the emergency room with a respiratory tent. But I remember speaking with a mentor when I got back, and he said it really shouldn't have been that hard. And yet, I believe that as far as systems go, Stanford outperformed, and I believe that VA Palo Alto may have served as a model system for how to respond in a public health crisis. And so these heroic improvisations, if we notice them, show us what might be possible. They reveal ingredients of a better system, a true national health security enterprise. Okay, so before I deconstruct COVID myths, I've got to just do some COVID fact checking. Um, it is crazy to me that this needs to be reviewed, but every week or so I bump into people, patients, even some doctors who uh, think that these are opinions. They're not, they're facts. So COVID was deadly and spread easily. The initial, you know, when all was said and done, case fatality rates uh, among an immune naive population were about half a percent. And the effective reproductive number was between three and four uh, for the ancestral variant. Vaccines worked wonders, uh, and we remember the 95% efficacy. Boosters, uh, they worked. So with the help of a resident, I calculated the number needed to vaccinate on the initial Israeli booster study. It was 56 to prevent one hospitalization over six months. We recently learned, thanks to VA-based research, that, boost, that vaccines offer 70% protection against post-acute sequelae of COVID. Regarding risk, yes, they cause about uh, they increased increase the likelihood of myocarditis uh, by about uh, one case in 100,000. Uh, the cases uh, they are usually mild and uh, generally occur after dose two in 20 to 40 year old men. 
Antivirals prevent hospitalizations and don't cause rebound. The benefits in younger adults where that risk factors aren't clear or in uh, vaccinated young adults uh, with one risk factor. And masks work too. So the best RCT we have, a community mask distribution program showed 11% fewer infections over six months uh, without any enforcement of adherence. And 35% uh, of patients over, and it was a 35% risk reduction in patients over 60. School masking, masking uh, you know, it uh, certainly had its harms, uh, but in terms of preventing infections, it certainly appeared to work, at least in the Boston, the, uh, Boston school system, where infections increased by 29% after uh, mask, uh, mask requirements were lifted. And then, of course, this last fact, America performed poorly. Uh, as of the end of 2022, we had 1.3 million excess deaths, which was 40% greater than Europe. So those are the facts. Uh, and I share them because as we begin deconstructing myths and building new ones, we need to, uh, with the hope of converging on new myths for what healthcare can and should be, uh, we need to at least agree on these basics. So myth number one, uh, institutions have lost trust. So I, this is almost trite to say at this point, uh, and, uh, but surveys have been done. Uh, uh, most recently, the, the most recent that I could found was by the American Board of Internal Medicine, uh, showing that uh, most patients trust that yeah, doctor patients trust their doctors, doctors trust doctors, and most patients uh, and physicians trust in the healthcare system remained the same or increased. There was this thirty percent of both doctors and patients uh, who, over the course of the pandemic, lost trust in the system. Now, as far as which institutions uh, people do or don't trust, you know, I'll, I'll get to uh, government institutions in a moment. Physicians tend to trust them. Patients seem not to. Um, and, but what I will say is that some institutions have earned trust. So back to those vaccination rates. Um, so this on the left was a study conducted by uh, a mentor of mine, Steve Ash, just survey data um, of a thousand veterans, found that um, the, of the, that, that when veterans listed their most trusted sources of healthcare information, the VA and my VA healthcare provider were um, items two and four. Coming back to vaccination rates, so uh, in VA Palo Alto, uh, we achieved full vaccination, first and second doses in 95% of our patient population. Uh, when you look at bivalent boosters, we approached 50%, and the most recent formulation, we're at about 35. But while some institutions have maintained trust, others are undermining trust for profit. You get better when you're not blamed for a condition you can't control. You get better when your care doesn't depend on your income. You get better when your pain isn't minimized. This myth forgotten. You will never stop trying to get better. Because when medicine gets better, all of us get better. Ah, so. Eli Lilly uh, is rebranded itself from a pharmaceutical company to a medicine company. Um, seems like good strategy. Um, I was I remember watching that with my son uh, uh, while watching the baseball All Star game, and uh, remembered you know thinking yeah I agree with the making care independent of income thing, 
and I, you know, certainly I'm all for getting better, but I don't think that it's medicine or doctors that I know who are telling patients that they're, uh, uh, or are blaming patients for conditions they can't control or who are minimizing or ignoring their pain. So myth number two, uh, healthcare systems are broken. So, you know, I've already shown you our lab turnaround times and our antiviral prescribing data, um, but what about mortality? Uh, how did uh, the VA do? I think the first thing I wanna call attention to is the fact that the VA was tracking this nationwide using the, something called the National Surveillance Tool. Um, it um, has tracked VA cases, VA deaths, VA hospitalizations, and more. Um, and uh, according to that tool, so the this calculated case fatality rate, uh, COVID at the VA was 2.6%. And in America, America more broadly, it was 1.1%. Now, of course, the tool has its limitations. It um, misses deaths that may not have occurred at a VA facility. It misses diagnoses that may not have occurred at the VA. Um, but li those limitations aside, um, you know, at first I was troubled by the higher case fatality rate at the VA, and then I realized the average age of a VA patient is 20 years older than the age of an average American, which sort of equates to a really, uh, order of magnitude greater risk of death uh, uh, after a COVID infection. And when these are adjusted, the VA seemed to perform pretty well. Uh, now, Again, there are lots of limitations. I don't want to get carried away with conclusions. I'm an English major. I'm not a statistician. Uh, I solicited a statistician, um, David Huberman, with help from our uh, uh, research chief, Jennifer Lee, to try to calculate correlations between uh, VAs that were high antiviral prescribers and VAs that, say, had patients with adverse outcomes. So... Here, I saw what appeared, I know, of course, it's limited to six observations, but I can imagine a trend line um, connecting these six facilities um, across the West Coast to the VA. The problem is that um, it was a positive correlation. So it suggested that the more antivirals that are prescribed, uh, the more patients end up in the hospital, which is not uh, what, what uh, the, the drugs are intended to do. So then I realized, okay, well, you know, maybe we just see more hospitalizations because there are some VAs have bigger hospitals and maybe we see more hospitalizations because some uh, VAs with less capacity send their patients to non-VA facilities. Um, and conversely, maybe patients get prescriptions outside the VA that aren't captured. So, you know, I tried to normalize it for um, deaths uh, or to, to calculate as the outcome deaths ICU stays, and the dots were really all over the chart. So there didn't appear to be a correlation. And so, you know, what does that tell us? I don't think it tells us that the facilities that prescribe more antivirals have patients end up in the hospital more. What it tells us is that population level outcomes of systems level interventions are hard to measure. It's easier in integrated systems like the VA. Care fragmentation makes it harder. And to build better systems, that retain public trust, it is absolutely critical that we get better at measuring population level outcomes. So again, care fragmentation makes measurement difficult. Now, here I'm gonna talk briefly about the Mission Act. This was a piece of legislation passed amid great controversy in, I believe it was 2018. Um, there were, uh, let's say, lobbying interests that, um, would did not include any of the six leading veterans groups that advocated for this act, which I think widely privatized and increased access to private sector healthcare for VA patients using VA dollars. So, you know, th these are some of the headlines from that time. Of course, there's sort of a political bent to them. And what we have seen in the years since then is that the fastest growing line item in the VA's budget is community care outlays, growing by 9% per year. They have doubled since um, 2018. And they um, made up fully 25% of the VA's operating budget in 2022. 
Um, we've been hearing about these budget issues at the VA for most of the last year, been unable to hire physicians. Um, and then I was surprised when uh, I received a, a link last week to an article saying that uh, there was a, yes, in addition to this budget shortfall, there was a House committee member who was suggesting that uh, the issue was not community care outlays, but more hiring. Now, I sought the sort of wise counsel of my section chief or my division chief, excuse me, my uh, uh, um, uh, service chief, excuse me, uh, Paul Heidenreich, who th this was his perspective that the community care uh, versus in-house debate is really just a cover for a larger question. Should the VA health system even exist? So there are factions hoping to eliminate it, uh, but they uh, and they may have enough weight to produce new legislation. Now, one aspect um, um, that why a VA should remain is so that we can test various aspect of, aspects of managed care that could be used in Medicare and Medicaid to del possibly deliver better care at similar to less expensive costs. So now I'm gonna talk about myth number three, physicians as heroes. So, Abraham Verghese, of course, is a, a mentor of mine, and he described uh, in 2005 the calling of medicine, acknowledged that maybe it was an old-fashioned idea, uh, and yet students continued to enroll in medical school, coming to the profession for timeless reasons, service, suffering. And yet, 20 years later, uh, Lisa Rosenbaum wrote, they sort of updated this myth um, and the subtitle for her piece in the New England Journal was From Privileged Professionals to Cogs of Capitalism. And a key quote, so as society's reckoning with work uh, converges with medicine's corporatization, the sacrifices that once brought physicians spiritual fulfillment have increasingly been replaced by a sense that were simply cogs in a wheel. Now, Rosenbaum's article doesn't endorse this view, and it goes on to describe even uh, the most skeptical trainees who despite sometimes feeling that way, still show up for work. And I work with those trainees every day. So the sort of myth 3.5, residents as heroes and residents as advocates for themselves. So of course, we remember how uh, our residents at Stanford um, felt like many patients left out by the healthcare system. And yet, during the pandemic, uh, in our homeless outreach clinics, those veterans traveled to our shelters, gave vaccines, described it as their best day of residency. Uh, I remember one day during the Omicron wave, there it was, I always remember it as an ice pick. I was out sick, uh, or not sick, caring for a sick kid with COVID. And one of our residents, Tim Ellis Kaleo, among others, uh, filled my shoes to serve as one of our first prescribers on duty. So this is within about three weeks of the Paxlovid emergency use authorization. Uh, our emergency room was busting at the seams. Uh, our the nurse in clinic informed Tim that uh, the, there's a patient who would have qualified for Paxlovid if he um, uh, if he tested positive. Tim switched him to a rapid test and the patient walked out with a prescription less than less than two hours later. So now I come back to the title of my talk. Um, so uh, for those who bore the battle. So that comes from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, and to do all which we may, which we may, which we, which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Now, um, regarding the hero myth, uh, unfortunately, uh, this April 4th, 1865 was four days before he was assassinated. Um, so, in mythology, uh, 
things for heroes often don't end well. And very quickly, heroes can be turned into martyrs or villains. So I'd like to propose a vision of medicine uh, as a public utility. Uh, it's like electricity or water. It's essential to a functioning society. It can't rely on individual heroes. So during wartime, uh, it requires a systems-wide mobilization to maintain it. Wartime being pandemics, other crises. And then during peacetime, we need to replenish that system. And one of the systems we may need to replenish is the stories we tell ourselves even about the function of medicine. So I described a vision as, of a physician sort of as an unglamorous population risk manager. So instead of individual heroes, we need working systems. We need to be the ones to build them and maintain them. I believe academic medical centers can, can show us how. I think we need to figure out how to implement the innovations that we have. Uh, Donna, my introducer, Dr. Zolman, uh, just gave a talk on implementation science about two weeks ago, um, saying that there wasn't a choice between basic science and implementation science. But as I and gathered from her co-presenter, Dr. Ash, uh, the NIH allocates something like 2% of its budget to implementing, equitably implementing the services that we have. I think we can do better. I have a vision where academic medical centers show us uh, how to move from services uh, to, to, from thinking about services to thinking about patients to thinking about population level outcomes. And with that in mind, I'd like us to think about moving from training physician scientists to training population health innovators. So this is a QR code. You scan it, it'll take you to a chat bot that uh, helps uh, automatically monitor veterans' blood pressure. So with that in mind, I've got a vision of academic medical center as Plato's Academy. So Plato's Academy, ancient Greece, uh, wasn't, yes, it trained scientists, but it was about training, training scientists as public servants, as leaders who can make policy, could run organizations, and yes, who can deconstruct the myths that threaten society and then rebuild new ones that don't. And so I'm actually going to put a um, bit of call to our new, uh, our new chief of medicine. So Dr. Ashley, I got your email a few weeks ago. I was moved by the sort of vision that we have at our fingertips an unprecedented power of discovery and an opportunity to translate it toward better diagnosis and treatments. And to that, I would add better care delivery, better population health surveillance, and better emergency response systems. So epilogue, physicians in the next crisis. Uh, this is the last literary quote. Uh, this is from James Baldwin quoting uh, a spiritual. So God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. So a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in the same clinic room where I diagnosed my first case of COVID back in March, 2020. And it was early June, or sorry, late June. And I diagnosed influenza A, which seemed a little unusual in late June. And I had a bit of a scare. I asked uh, uh, the same infectious disease uh, brain trust that I'd worked with during the pandemic um, can you help me get this sequenced? And I found out uh, that all positive flus automatically go to the public health uh, reference lab, which is part of a national influenza surveillance system. Um, so this was reassuring. I don't think from what I have gathered that the next uh, crisis is going to be H5N1. So these are pictures from our respiratory tent in the summer of 2020. So the temperature in the tent went above 100 degrees. The air indoors wasn't safe. The heat outdoors wasn't safe. We eventually moved to a parking garage. And for a while, that cooled things off until the orange sky day. And on the orange sky day, things were cool because uh, clouds of smoke blocked out the sun. So. The pand during the pandemic, it was hard not to th see things through an apocalyptic lens. And 
you know, as we think about rebuilding systems, and I think about rebuilding physicians' belief systems and value systems, you know, I ask myself, what will we do? What will we do when the next crisis comes? And I believe from what I saw over the last four years that we'll step up. All right. Thank you. Dr. Stevenson, that was that was great. Thank you for that. Uh, with our remaining time, um, I had a, I have a lot of questions I wanted to ask you, but with our remaining time, I, you mentioned your mentor, Dr. Ash. He had a really great question, and I asked him to join us on the panel side so he could uh, say some comments and mention to you directly. So, Dr. Ash, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Can you guys hear me all right? Excellent. Yes. Hello, Steve. All right. Hey, Matt. What a great presentation. Um, yeah, I know you use the word um, heroic and visionary applying to other people, but don't forget it to apply it to yourself every once in a while, truly. Um, okay, I am worried about the fire next time too, just like you are. And you have some deep analysis of what happened during COVID. Say you were in the elevator with the next director of HHS or the next CDC director, and you had just a few seconds to give him one piece of advice that you think they could learn from the, your experience, the VA's experience. But what is the one myth that you would try and create in his mind? Yeah, well, uh, acknowledging that myths are, uh, you, you need to hold two contradictory ideas in your mind at one time. I'd say the, the critical function of medicine is providing care for individuals when they're sick and scared and maintaining trust. And so I think preserving the sort of creating systems that allow physicians to trust, uh, to sort of preserve um, their most fundamental values strikes me as being important. I don't know whether those are educational systems or management systems, but that strikes me as, as key. Um, and I don't know if I've exhausted my five seconds, but the um, I think the other thing is um, that shift from thinking about service level outcomes to patient level outcomes to population level outcomes and really designing systems and whether that's with um, capitated value-based payment or something else that um, cause healthcare systems and payers to take ownership over a population really in the way that the VA does from the time someone enrolls to the time of their death and then even gives them a decent burial afterward. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Back to you, Errol. Thanks so much, Dr. Ash. Uh, 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 yes, Dr. Stevenson. So uh, as I mentioned, I had a lot of questions. We we're just passing nine o'clock. I know people are running to clinic. Um, I want to end, uh, uh, Dr. Barman had a, put in this uh, comments in the questions a little earlier, and you, you mentioned her uh, throughout your presentation. She was a, one of our many very key players in, during throughout the pandemic. Matt, as someone who worked with you during residency, I'm not at all surprised you stepped up and became the leader when it was needed. Echoing what Dr. Ash just mentioned, uh, you definitely highlighted, you did a great job of highlighting how we have so many heroes uh, in this community and, and did so many key things. It was really valuable to, to revisit much of that and learn talk about the learning key points. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for presenting. And uh, again, thank you for being such a great clinician. Uh, everybody, thanks for sticking with us the rest of the day. And uh, Matt, that was a great job. Thanks, everyone. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.